Thanks, everybody. I, I spoke about a lot of stuff during my lecture uh, that was uh, also the same subject as the stuff I was going to talk about this morning. So I don't want to talk about the same thing again that I talked about in my lecture. So I made a couple of notes here. I came to my first IBM convention in 1965. And that's when uh, how, uh, Zany Blaney did his levitation. And I remember I was halfway into the audience, about halfway back, and everyone stood up. I don't know who else. Was anyone else at that convention? Remember that? Everyone stood up. They couldn't believe what we were saying. Bev was there. 1965. It was a long time ago. And I think I went to my first Abbott's Magic Get Together in 64. I saw John Mulholland there. Uh, I've seen uh, some great magicians over the years, but there's very few real magicians. But Tommy Wonder was a real magician. A real magician. The, the Korean last night, uh, yesterday in close up, what's his name? Unbelievable. You know, when you see a real magician, it, wants, it makes you want to stay in this profession. It makes you want to appreciate what we do more than the heckling and all the all the negative stuff that we find in this business because there are a lot of negative things in this business. Travel is one of them, obviously. But when I was a kid and uh, continued all my life, I've been so naive. When I was a little boy and I'd get on a school bus, I remember I wanted to be Donald Duck when he died. I used to do Donald Duck when I was a kid, and I figured when Donald Duck passed away, I'd want that job. That's how, That's how naive I was. Oh, did you enjoy your cereal by any, by the way? That's what I had, cereal. That's what I eat. I'm not an egg and bacon kind of guy, so I had cereal this morning, and I had a kind waitress who brought it to me. But being naive sort of helped me. I talked about naive and naivete yesterday when I was talking about Red Skelton because when I called him, I just thought I could talk to him on the phone and we'd become friends in some way. And I was so naive that no one came up to me and said, you just can't call someone like that and talk to him. Well, I did. And my whole life changed. I don't know where I would be today if it weren't for meeting Red Skelton. It's not just the impersonation I did of him and the show that I did, the tribute show, but. I learned so much from him as an individual. Uh, he told me once that, he said, you'll never, you'll never realize the love of an audience. He said, there'll be the day that you'll actually feel the love of the audience coming over the footlights. And I didn't really know what he meant. But almost every show I did in Branson, one person, sometimes more than one person, they'd come up to me and say stuff like, you know, my mother's dying of cancer and she were touring America to, so she could see stuff before she passes away and we came to see your show. And, and stuff like that. And Red said you're going to get all kinds of that stuff because people want to laugh. They, my, my mom told me when I was a kid, she said there'll always be humor. You know, no matter what the condition of the world is, there will always be humor. If you look back at World War II, we were really dancing. America was dancing. We were in the swing era. We were having fun, and we were trying to forget about the war and all the GIs over there doing what they're doing. I enlisted for three years. Um, I didn't have any hard time. I was performing most of the time. and uh, Magic opens so many doors for me, and it, I'm sure it has for you too. Wherever you go, it opens doors, and people know you're a magician, they want to see a trick, and even the lady who brought me my cereal this morning. Uh, I felt sort of bad asking for it, but she was very nice about it. We had a few laughs together. And that's another thing. The other night when I did my lecture, two from waitresses came up to me afterwards, and they said, well, I want to thank you for saying what you did about waitresses, because it's a hard job. And when you do a trick or you're, or you're friendly to a waitress, it doesn't have to be a magic trick, just be friendly to them or just say something, tell them a joke or something. It makes their day because it's a very, very hard thing to be in service. A bartender, you know, it's all you hear is people snapping their fingers. <laughs> Another time that I was very naive is when I was a little boy, Clyde Beatty came to uh, Wisconsin. Three, three ring circus, the tent and everything. They, I said to my mom, I said, can I go out and see him set up the circus? And she said, yes. So I rode my bike out to the lot, like five in the morning. And it was the true circus. It was the elephants putting up the tent. It was one of the most exciting things that I ever saw in my life. I was like nine years old. And I said, can we go to the show tonight? And I, we weren't very, uh, we, I was pretty poor when I was a kid, so we didn't have much money. And my mom said, yeah, we'll use your allowance for the next couple of weeks. So we went to the circus. 
make a long story short, the show started, it was unbelievable. And halfway through the show, there was an equestrian act and one of the horses got loose. And it ran around, they stopped the show, the band started playing the, the SOS music for the <laughs> roustabouts and the clowns to come out and help. And it, it was a mayhem, it was absolute mayhem. And this horse was running around, it almost jumped in the stands. It was one of the most exciting things I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> And we went home, and the next day I said, Mom, can, we go, can I go again tomorrow? They're leaving the next day. Can I go to the circus one more time? And she said, yeah. I went by myself. The same horse got loose. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was exactly the way I saw it the day before. And I learned of, that's when I learned about show business. I learned that it isn't always what you see. And I'm not saying it lowered my what I thought about it, I still thought it was a wonderful experience, but just that little bit of a thing that it all turned around, the excitement all turned around and it made everybody, you know, like a one-time experience. I walk in the next day and it happened all over again. So I learned a lot on that. And the same thing happened when I was, uh, do you remember International Showtime? It was one of my favorite shows. It was uh, Don Amici hosted it in the 60s. It was a show about one ring circuses in Europe. And I saw a guy do an act there, and I thought I could do it. And what he was doing a trapeze act. So I went into the barn, and we had a rope that hung from the center of the barn. <clears throat> and I attached a ladder to the bottom of it. And I'd swing back and forth, and I'd let myself go onto the hay bales, and I'd fall into the hay. And it was just, I was in the circus. But one time I went off, and I, I got off the ladder, and I fell into the, into the straw, and I got up, and I was looking around, wondering where the ladder was. And I turned around and it was coming right straight towards me. <laughs> and it hit me in the center. I have a scar right in the middle of my uh, forehead up here. It's a dead center. People think it's a part of my hair, but it's actually where I got whacked in the head with this ladder. But every time I'd see someone on TV, I thought I could do it. I was so naive when I saw a guy throwing knives or, you know, a knife thrower. I had my sister, she was probably five or six years old. <laughs> the tree and I put a balloon in her mouth <laughs> and I was throwing darts and knives and thank God I didn't hit her I, and my mom drove up in the driveway and she saw that <laughs> I'm up here sir <laughs> why are you taking pictures <laughs> the laughter right <laughs> But to be naive, you know, just to go into something thinking that you can do it. And I, that's the way I was when I was a kid. When I was in the service, believe it or not, and I'm talking about when I was 18 years old, I did this. I wrote the Queen of England when I was in Germany. <laughs> and I asked if I could do a show for her. I mean, talk about naive. <laughs> I got a letter, a beautiful letter. I still have it in my scrapbook. It's from the House of Lords, the guy in charge. I don't know what the title was, but he said the Queen is busy this week. <laughs> and I, I look back at that time and I wonder what magic did I have at that time that I would have done for the Queen. I don't even know what I would have done. It was just, just I was just so damn naive. It was unbelievable. And when I had the tomfoolery, it was the same thing. I trusted everybody. Why would someone? Why would someone steal from me? Why would someone take advantage of me if I'm, you know? But it happened. You want to believe in people, you want to trust people, but you, sometimes you can't. And as time goes on and uh, um, the things get worse and worse relating to this, it's hard to trust people. And I don't like that, but sometimes you have to. Um, when I was a kid, uh, all of my magic was uh, learned from books. I didn't know any magicians until I went to my first magic convention, which is the, uh, inter, uh, the uh, Houdini Club convention. It was in Appleton, Wisconsin in 1964, I think. And that's where I met all the friends that I, I met Neil Foster, and I saw Jack Chan, and Paul Diamond, and all of the great people at uh, Bev, all of the great people at, uh, during that time. And then when I had the Tom Fullery, and Bev Bergeron, and Mark Wilson, and Don Allen, and uh, Harry Lorraine, and all these people would come to see me, it was the thrill of a lifetime. And that was a naive, a naive moment too, that these people are coming to see me and I used to idolize them when I was a kid. And it's wonderful to see these kids at the convention, you know, learning and, and learning stuff from older people, the experienced people, because Carol Fox and Duke Stern and all of those guys, they sat down with me and they spent time with me. And 
I don't think I could ever uh, pay anyone back for stuff like that, especially the, the ones who are no longer around. But it, it really, really means a lot when you meet someone who influences you. Like I said yesterday, all professionals were once amateurs. You know, we all have people that we've idolized and so forth. But when I was coming up at Magic, I never was overexposed. A lot of magicians you see around uh, convention, they're pick a card, pick a card, watch this, watch this, watch this. I never did anything. But I would have one or two tricks, like I had my wallet. That's really where my popularity began, was with the Mollica wallet. Uh, I don't even remember what year I came out with it, but it was a great trick. Everyone loved it, people bought it, a lot of people used the Mollica wallet. But I think it's better to use less to not overexpose yourself. So many magicians just overexpose themselves. They're just all continuously doing magic. Have you ever been to a party and, you just, and people know you're a magician and you just reach into your pocket for a cigarette or a wallet or something and they're, they're wondering what you're gonna do and they just can't wait? That's what I like. So if you don't do magic, they're continuously just watching you and they're wondering what, what you're gonna do. And then when you wanna do one thing that's really, really great. Can I have your water glass? Are you done with your water? I did this in Brazil last month. Are you done with it? This is something that Jonathan, the amazing Jonathan showed me. And I did this on the streets of Brazil. And I had kids dying of laughter. And all of the adults were looking at me like they were wanting to kill me because they knew that their kids were all going to go home and do this. <laughs> <laughs> but Jonathan takes a, he takes a mouth full of water and then he waits for a while. And then when the opportune moment is, is right, when everyone's looking at him, he does this. pieces of Bubblicious bubblegum, and uh, there's some things that I do that aren't tricks at all. They're just what I call bits, you know, Red Skelton did these little bits, like a pouring water or squirting water out of my mouth, those kind of things. Um, that really gets a lot of attention. It doesn't have to be a magic trick. Jim Ryan used to entertain waitresses all the time when we'd have dinner, and that, those are the things that people remember. So magic is, uh, like I said, opened so many doors for everybody, and I owe my whole life to magic. Uh, magic's been my life, and now life is my magic. You know? um, if I would say one thing to anyone, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think your personality or how hard you treat other people is what's the most important. Uh, when you come out on stage, if people don't like you or, or if you've got a cocky attitude or if, you don't, if you're not pleasant, you can do the best magic and the people could care less. There were some entertainers last night, they walked out on stage, and you loved them the minute they walked out. I, f I have that, I don't know what it is, people, I don't think I have that much to offer, but so many people look at me and talk to me as if I'm some big star or something, I'm not, I'm just a magician who got some good breaks, and I had a good time with the tomfoolery, and I enjoy the, I enjoy the art, and I tell everybody about how I enjoy the art, and I help kids if they want to get into it, but I also tell them that this is not gonna be something that I suggest as everyone else does to have something else to fall back on. Um, I did the Red Skelton show for 17 years and now I'm having a hard time becoming Tom Mullica. <laughs> I really am, you'll see tonight on the show, I'll come out and try and be myself, but I'll, try, I'll slowly fade into Red Skelton and I'll try and pull myself back out of it. I don't mean to do it, but it's 17 years of acting that way. The hardest part for me in my career right now is being myself. So I've created a new act, and which you'll see tonight. Um, 
and I'm not going to be around too much this afternoon because I have to go over and rehearse and I'm um, seeing the show, so I'll be with all the entertainers and make sure everything's okay for tonight. But I wanted to thank you all for having me this year, and I wanted to thank you for having me at the breakfast this morning. And um, It's really been a, an emotional uh, trip for me because getting into magic after being away for so long is um, it's sort of hard because I'm not the guy I used to be. We were just talking about that. And, but magic is my life, and all of my friends are my life, and I will continue to go to magic conventions as long as I live because this is my family. And I appreciate you all having me this morning. Thank you very much. out here from all the other committees. If any of you have anything to say, I'll be glad to have you come up if there's any other announcements if I've missed anything. But first, mine. I want to say thanks for all the help I got. This is the first year that I've been chairman of the Order of Merlin Com Committee, along with Carl Mink and Worst Carl. There he is in the back. So if you could give Carl a great hand. Thank you. The other people that I want thanks to for pulling all of this off is guys like Mike Stratman and Becky Wells, who printed all of these programs that you have at your table. Um, Anya Castle, who set up, I thought the breakfast was delicious this morning. She selected the whole menu, and I thought that was great. Bob Patterson, who took care of all the registration.